Okay, migration after the Genesis flood. How did plants and animals spread around the world so quickly? Well, this talk is about a subject called biogeography. The word biogeography is derived from Greek. Bio means organic life, G or geo, the earth, and graphy writing. Biogeography simply means the geography of life. It's the study of where on the earth we find the different kinds of plants and animals. Actually, this talk is really about two competing views of earth history. The secular evolutionary ancient earth view and the biblical creationist young earth view. Let's look firstly at the evolutionary ancient earth view. According to this, the earth is billions of years old and natural processes have been slowly changing the earth's continents and slowly changing life on earth over many millions of years. If we go back a couple of hundred million years, so we're told, the earth looked something like this. All the continents were together in one great continent they call Pangaea. And the world we see today, we're told, formed as this single landmass split up, as the continents we know today slowly drifted apart. Something like this. And we can see that here as a repeating animation. And as this was happening, so we're told, as the continents were slowly drifting apart over millions of years, the dinosaurs went extinct, reptiles evolved into birds, non-flowering plants evolved into flowering plants, and of course, apes turned into people. And so the evolutionists tell us, when we study biogeography, we find lots of evidence supporting this view. Indeed, there's a mountain of evidence, they say, from biogeography showing that evolution is true. And a mountain of evidence confirming that the continents split apart millions of years ago, separating the various kinds of plants and animals that lived on the earth around that time. When we go to Africa, we find uh, leopards, rhinoceroses, giraffes, and gorillas. In America, we don't find any of these. Instead, we find raccoons, jaguars, armadillos, and opossums. And when we go to Australia, we find marsupials, such as kangaroos. And evolutionists say, that the reason we find these different animals on these different continents is that they evolved in these different parts of the world. So we're told uh, gorillas are found in Africa and not in America because they evolved in Africa and not in America. Armadillos are found in America because they evolved there and nowhere else. Evolutionists also claim that strong evidence for evolution can be found from studying the uh, biogeography of islands. Just about here in the Pacific Ocean, around 500 miles off the coast of South America, we find the Galapagos Islands. They're quite small and cover a distance of only around 100 miles. And evolutionists make much of the different species of finch found here. We find, for example, the large cactus finch, uh, the warbler finch, the woodpecker finch, uh, the medium ground finch, uh, the mangrove finch, and the common cactus finch. In fact, it's thought that there are around 13 different species of finch found on these islands. One of the prominent features of the Galapagos finches is their different beak shapes. And of particular significance is that each finch has a beak best suited to the kind of food found on the island where it lives. 
Some have strong, stubby beaks, which are best for crushing hard seeds. Others have thinner beaks, which are best for probing flowers or fishing insects from the crevices of trees. And so the story goes, and there's much to be said for it. One original species of finch flew to the Galapagos Islands from the mainland and then diversified into all the different species we now find there. This is often termed speciation, where a number of uh, different species arise from one original species. Actually, much more impressive examples of speciation can be found on the Hawaiian Islands, right out in the middle of the Pacific. Around 500 unique species of fruit fly can be found here. Hawaii is also home to more than a thousand different species of snails and slugs, uh, which again are not found anywhere else in the world. And evolutionists claim that what we find on the, the, the Galapagos and Hawaiian Islands provides absolutely irrefutable evidence supporting their theory of evolution. Within mammals, there are two main groups, the placentals and the marsupials. Placental mammals, uh, such as humans, complete their embryonic development in the uterus joined to the mother by a placenta. Marsupial mammals, such as kangaroos, have a very different reproductive system, where the mother carries and suckles her young in a pouch at the front of her body. And we can see a few more placentals here on the left and a few more marsupials on the right. These are two key terms for this presentation placentals and marsupials. There are around 140 species of marsupial found in Australia, most of which are not seen anywhere else. We find, for example, the wallaby, the Tasmanian devil, as it's called, uh, the red kangaroo, uh, the koala, and the wombat. And according to evolutionists, there's a very straightforward explanation for this. Yes, you've guessed it. These marsupials evolved in Australia. According to Professor Richard Dawkins, the pattern of geographical distribution of plants and animals is just what you would expect if evolution had happened. And Jerry Coyne, who's professor of biology at the University of Chicago, had this to say. The biogeographic evidence for evolution is now so powerful that I have never seen a creationist book, article or lecture that has tried to refute it. Creationists simply pretend that the evidence doesn't exist. Well, I said this subject is really about two competing views of Earth history. What then is the biblical creationist young Earth view? Well, many creationists believe that there was originally one great continent when God first created the world. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 9, God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. The Bible also tells us that around 1,600 years after creation, God judged the world with a global flood. And this would have been much more than just a deluge. There would have been much geological activity, ground movements, volcanism, and so on. And probably a majority of creation scientists, not all, but I think a majority would agree that the continents we know today did split apart from the one original landmass. And they would say this happened at the time of the Genesis flood, when all this geological activity was going on. Of course, they wouldn't say that it happened slowly, over millions of years, but rapidly. Not by continental drift, but by continental sprint.
And it's important to note that according to this model, the movement of the continents occurred beneath the floodwaters. So we wouldn't have had living populations of plants and animals being split up by this continental separation. During the flood, the whole of the pre-flood world was destroyed. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 17, God said, I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. So the world we see today grew up after this global catastrophe and over the last 4,500 years or so. Plants left floating on the surface of the waters would have recolonized the areas where they finally settled after the floodwaters receded. And animals that disembarked the ark would have migrated to the places they now inhabit. The question we might ask is this, which view is best supported by the scientific evidence, the data? The secular evolutionary ancient earth view or the biblical creationist young earth view? Well, firstly, the uh, finches on the Galapagos Islands and the many fruit flies and snails on the Hawaiian Islands are not a problem for creationists. We believe that God designed plants and animals with the capacity to vary within their kind so as to be able to adapt to different environments. And when we study this adaptation carefully, we actually find a problem for the evolutionists. And this is because there's growing evidence that this kind of adaptation occurs quickly. It doesn't require hundreds of thousands or millions of years. There's lots of evidence that plants and animals can change. Finches can become other species of finch. Fruit flies can become other species of fruit fly. And snails can become other species of snail. But this is hardly scientific evidence that an amphibian, that amphibians can become reptiles or that reptiles can become birds. And nor is it scientific evidence that apes can become people. Now you remember the evolutionary view that we have different animals on different continents because they evolved in these different parts of the world? Well, according to the theory of evolution, Jaguars and lions are descended from a common ancestor that lived around three million years ago. And after three million years of evolution, we're told we got jaguars in South America and lions in Africa. But it's possible to mate a jaguar and a lion and get a hybrid, a jag lion. If these two species, jaguars and lions, were really separated by three million years of evolution, it is most unlikely that their mutated DNA would allow them to hybridize. Evolutionists face an even bigger problem trying to explain hybrids between jaguars and leopards. And this is because the female of this kind of hybrid is fertile. Think about it. Three million years of separate evolution. Half the time it allegedly took for ape-like creatures to evolve into people. And the hybrid is still fertile. I don't think so. But the ability of these big cats to hybridize fits the biblical account of Earth history very well. You see, if jaguars and lions and tigers and so on are all descended from a pair of cats that stepped off the ark around uh, 4,500 years ago, it's not surprising that they can mate and produce offspring. Arguably, evolutionists face an even greater problem with the iguanas of the Galapagos Islands. The land and marine iguanas 
supposedly separated from their common evolutionary ancestor around 10 million years ago. But as we pointed out in our Darwin documentary, land and marine iguanas can mate and produce offspring. This amazed evolutionists when they first saw it. In the evolutionary view, South America and Africa were joined for millions of years. Why then are there more seed plants common to South America and Asia than to South America and Africa? Of around 200 seed plant families native to East and South America, only 156 are common to East and South America and Western Africa, whereas around 174 are common to Eastern South America and Eastern Asia. If South America and Africa had really been joined for millions of years, we would expect to find exactly the opposite. We would expect there to be more plants common to South America and Africa than to South America and Asia. Do you see the problem here for the ancient earthers? They say that South America and Africa were joined for millions of years. But there are more seed plant families common to South America and Asia than to South America and Africa. This is a statement by Dr Simon Mayo of the Royal Botanic Gardens near London. He said, The overall similarity of the plants of the two continents is surprisingly low given such a clear geophysical background. Dr Mayo expresses surprise that there are so few plants common to South America and Africa. Why is he so surprised? Well, he believes that these two continents were joined for millions of years. But the whereabouts of plants doesn't support this view. Some biogeographers have found this kind of data so puzzling, they have argued against the geologist's model of a supercontinent Pangaea, where South America and Africa were joined, and have suggested instead that there was a supercontinent they called Pacifica, where South America and Asia were joined. If the ancient Earth view were correct, we would expect the models and the data of the ancient Earth biogeographers to be consistent with the models and data of the ancient Earth geologists. We would expect them uh, to be harmonious, but they're not. Often, they're markedly contradictory. We find monkeys in South America, Africa and Asia. For example, we find the spider monkey in South America, the olive baboon in Africa, the langa in India, and macaques in Japan. Now, evolutionists tell us that monkeys evolved in Africa. Well, it's not difficult to see how they might have migrated to Asia. But how did they get to South America? You see, according to the theory of evolution, South America split off from Africa millions of years before monkeys had evolved. Evolutionists have similar problems explaining why we find rodents and some flowering plants on both these continents, because again, they are said to have evolved millions of years after South America split off from Africa. Currently, the western tip of Alaska is very close to the eastern tip of Asia. They are separated only by the very narrow Bering Strait. In fact, many people believe that in the recent past, these two parts of the world were joined. But according to evolutionists and their theory of slow continental drift, this has only been so for around 10 million years. Not for very long, in their thinking. Prior to this, in the supercontinent Pangaea, 
Alaska and Asia were separated by thousands of miles of ocean, by all the water on the far side of the globe. Now we find plant fossils of the same species in rocks either side of the Bering Strait. And these rocks were laid down in what evolutionists would call the Jurassic period. But the Jurassic period, we're told, ended around 150 million years ago. So according to this thinking, these identical plant fossils were buried at least 150 million years ago. Do you see the problem here for the ancient earthers? In their thinking, if we go back over 150 million years, Eastern Asia and Alaska weren't close to one another, as we see on this slide, they were separated by thousands of miles of ocean. Why then do we find plant fossils of the same species buried in Jurassic rocks in these two very distant regions? And this is yet another example of the kinds of conflict that arise between ancient earth biogeography and ancient earth geology. We find the same living species of plants and animals in America and Asia. For example, we find the same species of elk in California and China. In fact, there are many similar plants and animals found in Eastern Asia and Eastern North America, but not in the regions between them. Now, evolutionists try and explain this by saying that uh, millions of years ago, the northern regions were warmer, and Eastern Asia and Eastern North America were part of one continuous plant and animal distribution, like this. And a few million years ago, they say, the climate then cooled and the plant and animal life was separated. But again, their millions of years scenario hits a problem. And it's a big problem. You see, many of the plants in these two regions are regarded as being the same or virtually the same species. How then can they have been separated for millions of years. You see, if they had really been separated for millions of years, they would not be expected either by creationists or by evolutionists to have retained their similarities to the point where they would still be regarded as being the same or virtually the same species. You see, creationists would expect them to change because God appears to have designed plants and animals with the capacity to vary within their kind. And evolutionists would expect them to change because of mutations and their understanding of the evolutionary process. In evolutionary thinking, it took just five million years for ape-like creatures to evolve into people. Now let's be clear about this. There are considerable differences between apes and people. But to the evolutionist, this is easily explained. The evolutionary process, they say, is so powerful, it can bring about these remarkable changes in just a few million years. Why then did all these plants and animals in Asia and America not evolve too and change significantly over the same time period? From a creationist point of view, though, it would seem perfectly reasonable to understand that there was a continuous plant and animal distribution linking these two parts of the world. But of course, not millions of years ago, but in fairly recent history. Many plants and animals are found only in the northern and southern regions. Crowberries are one example. It certainly can't be said of these that they are found where they are because that's where they evolved. There are so many plants and animals found only in the northern and southern regions and not in between that some biogeographers 
have made the, the astonishing suggestion that these two parts of the world were once in contact. They have seriously suggested, based on biogeographic data, that the arrangement of the continents in the past was such that the northern and southern regions were joined. So again, we see the thinking and the views of the ancient Earth biogeographers in conflict with the thinking and views of the ancient Earth geologists, few of whom would have much time for the idea that the northern and southern regions were once joined. So how might we explain biogeography within the framework of biblical Earth history? Well, this is an article I wrote for Creation magazine in which I explain what some creationists believe to be one of the primary means by which plants and small animals spread around the world after the Genesis flood. And I'm referring to the hypothesis that this was by rafting on log mats driven by ocean currents. Interestingly, uh, a growing number of evolutionists are proposing rafting as an explanation for how some plants and animals migrated from one island to another, or, or even from one continent to another. When Mount St Helens erupted in 1980, a tsunami was generated in the nearby Spirit Lake. And this caused around one million trees uh, to be uprooted from the surrounding hillside. And these eventually settled on the lake as an enormous log mat. Following the great earthquake off the coast of Japan in 2011 and the resulting tsunami, a trail of debris formed in the Pacific Ocean around uh, eight, uh, sorry, 70 miles long and covering an area of over 2 million square feet. Now the effects of the Mount St Helens and Japanese tsunamis were nothing as compared with the destruction that would have been wrought by a global flood. The flood we read about in the book of Genesis would have resulted in billions of trees being left floating on the surface of the oceans. And these log mats would have been like enormous floating islands. And regularly watered by rainfall, they could have easily transported plants and small animals great distances. Some creationists believe that the pre-flood world included great floating forests, a bit like the quaking bogs that we know today. Perhaps these were broken up during the great flood as well and became rafts. The ability of ocean currents to distribute floating objects around the world was seen recently when thousands of bathtub rubber ducks were lost off a container ship in the uh, North Pacific. Within just a few months, these had floated to Indonesia, Australasia, and uh, uh, South America, and subsequently they floated into the Arctic uh, and Atlantic Oceans. And often we find plants distributed along coastlines and islands. This shows the distribution of the sago palm. It's found in East Africa, Madagascar, the tip of India, and parts of Indonesia and uh, Australasia. Pelagonium is another example. Uh, it's found right out in the Atlantic, in South Africa, Madagascar, East Africa, India, Sri Lanka, Southern Australia, and New Zealand. Here's another example, this time a type of fern plant, Strangariaceae. It's found in South Africa and along the eastern coast of Australia. This shows the distribution of a plant called Hook and Arn, a member of the carrot family. And based on the roots taken by the rubber ducks, it seems very reasonable to believe that rafting explains this. We can see here how the rubber ducks floated to North and South America. 
A prominent feature of biogeography is what's called tracks of dispersal. This is an example. It shows how Oreobulus plants dispersed throughout Indonesia, Australasia, and across the Pacific Ocean. And what's so significant about this is that many other plants and animals have followed a similar route. Note two, uh, incidentally, there's no direction uh, implied on this slide, no direction of dispersal. Note two, that all the plants and animals following this track are found either side of the Pacific Ocean. Now, when the habitats of plants and animals are broken by land or water, it's known as a disjunction. So we might say that all these plants and animals are disjunct across the Pacific. That's an important uh, word, an important concept for a little later in the presentation. A disjunction, where the same plants and animals are separated by land or water. Now, textbooks typically show the main biogeographic regions like this. This is the map for animals showing six main faunal or animal regions. Regions where we tend to find the same sort of animals. But these kinds of diagrams are really oversimplifications. A more realistic picture is like this, where we find many different plants and animals concentrated in small regions. And these are known as areas of endemism. Now, endemic means native or restricted to a particular area. And an area of endemism is one where there are a high number of endemic species, where many different species are found in the same small distinct regions. And here, each colour represents one of those regions. Interestingly, areas of high plant endemism often coincide with areas of high animal endemism. So these areas where we find lots of different plant species concentrated together tend to be the same as the areas where we find lots of different animal species concentrated together. And many areas of endemism are coastal regions and islands. For example, the tropical Andes, shown here enclosed in red on the left, is the richest and most diverse plant region on Earth. It contains around 15% of all the world's plant life in less than 1% of the world's land area. Around 20,000 of its 40,000 plant species are endemic. The area of Sunderland, enclosed in green to the right, contains 15,000 endemic plant species. And the island of Madagascar, enclosed in blue, has over 9,000 endemic plant species. We also find many similarities between these regions, where the same plants and animals are distributed around or either side of an ocean. And there are numerous patterns of uh, disjunction like this, where again and again we find the same plants and animals in the same widely separated areas. And I think that's the key to explaining biogeography. In the last century, a man called Leon Crozat plotted many tracks like these, showing dispersal routes across the world. And each of these lines is known as a generalised track, where many different plants follow the same route. Crozat's work emphasised that there are many tracks that cross oceans. And many tracks that follow coastlines. We see one here going right the way across the Arctic coast. 
another going down the eastern side of North and South America. Tracks covering much of the coast of Africa. Down the coast of Eastern Asia and down the western coasts of North and South America. We can see that on the right. Crozat's work made clear that many tracts of dispersal either cross oceans or follow coastlines. A good case can be made for the biogeographic regions being the oceans rather than the continents. Christopher Humphreys of the Natural History Museum in London and Lynn Parenti of the Smithsonian Institution wrote this. Characteristically, many disjunct patterns span ocean bottoms to the point that the oceans have been characterised as the natural biogeographic regions and the continents represent the land areas around the periphery. And to me, this is very strong evidence supporting the rafting hypothesis, that transport across oceans explains much of the biogeography of the world. I believe that many plants and small animals were transported on great log mats left over from the Genesis flood. And the areas of endemism we see today correspond to the landing places of these rafts. Interestingly, researchers at Bryan College in Tennessee show that the intersections of ocean currents with the continents tend to coincide with these areas of endemism. We see, for example, a number of currents circulating around the Pacific, also the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. So it's reasonable to think that ocean currents would have transported the log mats to these areas. Just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that small animals survived the flood on rafts. Rather, that the rafts would have facilitated their dispersal after the flood as they multiplied and migrated away from the ark's final resting place. Another way animals could have spread around the world is through migration across land bridges that are now below sea level. We believe that soon after the Genesis flood, there was an ice age. We don't believe in many ice ages, just one. And conditions would have been ideal for an ice age after the flood. The oceans would have been warm due to hot underground water being added to them at the beginning of the flood. And this warming of the oceans would have caused lots of water to evaporate into the atmosphere. At the same time, all the volcanoes erupting during and after the flood would have thrown lots of dust into the air, and this would have blocked some of the sun's heat, keeping the continents cool. So all this water vapour in the atmosphere would have fallen as snow, building up significant amounts of ice on the land. And sea levels would have dropped as the ocean's water evaporated and was then trapped on the continents as ice sheets. And land bridges would have appeared as sea level dropped. I think then it's reasonable to understand that there was a land bridge across what is now the Bering Strait and a number of land bridges linking parts of Indonesia and also uh, possibly Australasia. Of course, we don't see these land bridges today because much of the ice has now melted and sea levels have risen again. Also due to continued geological activity after the flood, other land bridges may have fallen below sea level. So it's not difficult to imagine how animals could have migrated to Ararat to various places around the world. 
Also, some plants and animals, especially those useful for farming, uh, may have been transported by man, particularly during the dispersal from Babel. I think, too, there was probably some rafting of small animals to Australia and uh, South America. In fact, North and South America may not have been connected until some time after the end of the flood. You can see I've shown North America slightly detached from South America. Well, what about marsupials? All those Australian animals that carry and suckle their young in pouches at the front of their bodies. Well, we do find marsupials elsewhere in some parts of America. But most marsupials are found in Australia and New Guinea, and many of these are found nowhere else. So how can we explain this within the framework of biblical Earth history? Well, I don't have any firm answers, but I can outline one possibility that I think uh, is quite plausible. Now you remember we're dealing here with two types of uh, mammal, placentals and marsupials. And there's some evidence to suggest that placentals tend to outcompete marsupials when they share the same habitats. And from a biblical point of view, this does seem plausible. Marsupials would have stepped off the ark alongside placentals and would have lived uh, around the Middle East and the surrounding continents. Yet only placentals live in those places today. It seems significant that North America has only one uh, marsupial, the Virginia opossum. Marsupials have become well established in Australia but largely in the absence of placentals. I suspect that competition from placentals drove marsupials to migrate away from the ark ahead of the placentals. Marsupials then gained an early foothold in Australia and South America, and without competition from placentals, they thrived in those places. And perhaps as the, as the log rafts broke up and sea levels rose and covered the land bridges, Australia and South America became more or less completely isolated before very many placentals had made their way to those continents. So, driven by competition from placentals, marsupials may have migrated to Australia and South America and then been protected from placental competition as these continents were cut off from the rest of the world. Fossils of marsupials are found on every continent. So in evolutionary thinking, marsupials died out on all the continents except the ones where we find them today. Why then can't creationists simply argue the same? Also, there are some interesting twists in the evolutionary story about marsupials. If in evolutionary thinking we go back to the late Cretaceous period, allegedly uh, around 65 to 80 million years ago, we don't find any marsupial fossils in either Australia or South America. At that period, they're found only in Europe, Asia and North America. An article in Science magazine said this. Living marsupials are restricted to Australia and South America. In contrast, marsupial fossils from the late Cretaceous are exclusively from Eurasia and North America. This geographical switch remains unexplained. So again, according to evolutionists, 65 million years ago, Marsupials lived in Europe, Asia and North America. They then died out in those continents and now live in Australia 
and South America. Well, if evolutionists can have marsupials dying out in Europe, Asia and North America, surely creationists can too. Another problem for evolutionists is the little mountain monkey of South America. DNA comparisons suggest that this little South American marsupial is more closely related to um, Australian marsupials than other South American marsupials. How then did it end up in America? It seems very difficult to argue that it evolved there. Well, in summary, the main evidence for evolution from biogeography is speciation, a fact of biology that is better explained by the creation model. The distribution of plants does not support the view that the continents were joined for millions of years. Fertile hybrids between animals uh, on different continents indicate that they have not been separated for millions of years. Plants and animals are concentrated in small regions of high biodiversity along coastlines and islands. And while these correspond to some degree with areas of high rainfall, this does not explain why there are so many patterns of disjunction, where the same plants and animals are found in the same widely separated areas. Such biogeographic observations, though, appear to be well explained by transport across oceans. Log rafts left over from the Genesis flood could have provided the means of rafting. Migration across land bridges may explain other biogeographic distributions. Also, following the confusion of languages at Babel, when humanity spread out around the world, people probably took with them plants and animals for farming and other purposes. As with other branches of science, the data appear to fit the biblical account of Earth history very well. Okay, well let's have a look at uh, some resources. There's a chapter on biogeography in my book, that's Evolution Good Science? Question mark. This also takes the main arguments presented by evolutionists generally in support of their theory and gives a clear scientific rebuttal to each. It concludes that the theory of evolution is not scientifically driven, but ideologically driven. That evolution is a belief system rather than a science. There's also a chapter on biogeography in the Creation Answers book. Uh, this is entitled, How Did the Animals Get to Australia? The Creation Answers book is a treasure. It answers the most commonly asked questions about the Bible and science, creation and evolution, and more than any other book, I think, it demonstrates that the Bible is a book that can be trusted. You know, when it comes to science, Bible-believing Christians are not in difficulties. And this book makes that very clear. There are also a couple of articles dealing with biogeography in Creation magazine. This is a DVD by Dr John Baumgardner. Dr Baumgardner is a geophysicist. And in this DVD, he presents his model of catastrophic plate tectonics and what he understands to have been their role in the Genesis flood and also in the rapid separation of the continents. 
There's a DVD by Mike Ord on the Ice Age. Mike is an atmospheric scientist and has produced a compelling model of how an Ice Age could have arisen in the decades and centuries following the Genesis Flood. Thank you for listening. <laughs>